Great. Well, thank you very much, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, I guess listening to that intro just tells me I, I can't keep a job. I think that's basically what, why I'm doing so many different things. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to speak to you. Um, as some of you know, um, I'm filling in as a keynote speaker tonight. Um, I guess last time I checked, Health Canada is still working. Um, so I've been told to, I guess the, the focus changes a little bit because obviously from Health Canada, what I'll be talking to you about is from the Canadian perspective, how Health Canada has been managing um, the work around dietary fiber uh, for the last few years, where we are currently. Um, to the extent possible, I'm going to also try to draw some comparison between how we look at fiber and how some of the recent US FDA um, changes that have been made around how they define and uh, managing fiber. And there's many areas that we're similar, but there are also some areas that we are still a little bit different. And that may be a good topic for some discussion following my, my presentation. So just a little bit of disclosure. The first one is that I'm not an expert on carbohydrates. So let's put it right out there. That's probably why you've never seen me in this uh, committee before. The, the good news is that I have many colleagues in Health Canada that are experts in carbohydrates and fiber specifically. So, so we do a lot of work on this area, and I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to present some of the work that we do and also um, walk you through some of the thinking around this topic in Health Canada. So I'll, I'll start by just describing how we have changed our view on fibers recently, and we have now revised our fiber policy. Um, we, we revised it a few years ago, and we further made some revision in 2017. We can't really talk about fiber and even the definition itself without getting into some kind of a claims discussion, and we'll spend a few minutes talking about that, and then also around some of the scientific requirement that we need for substantiating not just fiber, but also other kinds of health claims as well. So the topic of fiber comes up very regularly. A little bit of Canadian humor there, but fiber regularly. It's a tough crowd. I thought we were having some beer and wine, you'd be right into it. <laughs> so, in, in Canada, we've had a definition for fiber since 1985. But as a, fiber, as a definition gets a little bit old and as science advanced, we were hearing a lot of concerns and criticism that our fiber definition was no longer relevant and it was kind of, kind of becoming a little bit of a barrier to, to innovation. <coughs> so, a few years ago, we started taking a look at potentially revising the, the definition, and we came up with a new definition. And the way we did it was we actually divided the definition into two categories. The first category of fiber really is what basically the original definition was. So these are more the traditional fiber that come from plant material that have already been known and have a long history of being used and have functions that are commonly understood to be tied to fiber. What really changed is we developed a second category of fiber definition, what we call novel fibers. And this is where it opens up a lot more possibilities and it opens up a, to, to a much more heterogeneous category of substances that now can also fit under the broad heading of what is a fiber, at least in the Canadian context. So novel fiber basically, and you can read the definition here, it really opens up to capture any substance, whether it's plant-based, whether it is synthetic, whether it's been chemically modified, as long as these substances have certain characteristics that fits our definition criteria for a novel fiber, then they can be viewed as a fiber under this new definition. 
So really the key here is what are some of these characteristics that they must meet, at least one of them, to, in order to be called novel fiber. So these are the four physiological effects that have been recognized to be defined for novel fiber. Not, most of them are not surprising. The first one has to deal with the whole laxation function and in, marked by increasing stool bulk. The second effect is reduction of blood total and or low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels. The third one is reduction in postprandial blood glucose and or insulin levels or increase in sensitivity to insulin. Now, these three effects are actually very similar to some of the effects that the US FDA recently also communicated to be, as far as they're concerned, to be effects that would be acceptable for a, a fiber definition. The last criteria listed on this slide, the production of energy yielding metabolites through colonic fermentation, this one is where I think Canada is a little bit different from some of our international regulatory colleagues in how we now expanded the definition of novel fiber. To get this, to this a little bit more details, there is quite a bit of scientific evidence to show that fermentable fibers can act as a substrate, substrate for a bacterial community in the gut. And through this fermentation process, short chain fatty acid can be produced, and it has potentially a number of effects that could lead to some physiological benefit. Now, the key here is that when our scientists look at some of these studies and look at the effects, it's clear that it's actually more in line with viewing for this type of fiber from a nutrient standpoint rather than something that's going to give some other, physio other physiological markers. So the way we look at it is fermentable carbohydrates as long as they can do that, and as long as it produces short-chain fatty acid, it will lead to some positive effect in the body, like other nutrients will. And because of that, we've included this fourth criteria in our definition of a novel fiber. And this is where we differ from where the US FDA's current opinion is, is that in this last one, the fermentation part, that alone is not sufficient in the U.S. to make a substance qualified for to be defined as a fiber. When we looked at the actual potential health benefits beyond just providing energy, we are actually in line with all the other regulatory agencies around the world that have looked at this. Just at the US FDA, we also, our scientists also concluded that it does not actually convey any other substantiated health benefit and therefore would not be eligible for any other kind of health claim other than being able to be called a novel fiber. The European Food Safety Authority in 2015 also published an opinion that is very similar in that they also did not see any specific evidence to show that fermentation alone gives you effect that is substantiated for a health claim. So bottom line is, I think when I talked to my experts before I came here to the meeting today, when we look at definition for fiber, and I think sometimes they can also be extrapolated to when talking about things like prebiotics and probiotics, things get complicated, especially for the regulators, when in the definition of a substance, the element of benefit comes into the definition. Because then, just by calling something a fiber or a novel fiber, that can be viewed almost as an implied health claim and would require some kind of evidence. 
Now, the challenge there is to determine what level or what um, quality of evidence you need just to even call something a certain definition. And if you meet that bar, and if you want to go further and try to message that it can provide other benefits, then it almost then take it outside the definition and into the world of health claims. And again, different agencies have different principles and guidance around how each agency look at evidence for substantiating health claims and different types of health claims. So I think that's probably the one way to take a look at it is when you have something where the definition brings in some kind of a benefit element, then it's almost like a two-tier approach to looking at what the evidence is, first to call it the substance, and then you may have to go beyond and meet a higher bar if you want to actually substantiate a specific distinct health claim. So just maybe keep that in mind, and I'm more than happy to discuss that afterwards in the discussion period, whether that makes sense or whether that there, there may be another way to look at it. So bottom line is our definition now is pretty well um, communicated to all stakeholders. We've had a number of stakeholders come in and talk to us about trying to get approval for the new substances to be officially declared a novel fiber. And I'll get into that a little bit later. That you, there's a, We actually have a list that's published is regularly updated with new substances that now qualify officially um, with Health Canada's opinion that it is a novel fiber. But we also deal with some other aspects of fiber where claims actually are being requested. And when we look at the claims for fiber, we really use the same approach that we use for studying health claims for any other substances not just fibers or carbohydrates. So in the case of nitrate fiber, the most commonly sought after claim is what we call the nutrient content claims, where a product just want to be declared to have a high source, to be a, a source of fiber, so that consumer can be aware of it. And if they are looking for fiber, then they can um, select those products. So we have set parameters for source, high source, a very high source of fiber that can be declared on the label of a product and corresponding to two, four, or six grams of fiber per reference amount and serving size of that particular food. So that's pretty straightforward to a certain extent. It gets a little bit more complicated when we start getting to some of the other health claims such as um, are trying to convey other physiological effects that the fiber or the novel fiber may be uh, contributing. So that's what takes us into the whole health claim management side of things. <coughs> so just like other countries, we divide our health claims into different categories. The ones that probably require the most evidence and takes the longest for our evaluators to look at are the disease risk reduction and therapeutic claims. So here we can have a whole range of different claims such as reducing heart disease or lowering cholesterol, those seem to be the more popular ones. And in Canada, we have a relatively flexible approach when it comes to managing or regulating health claims. Even for disease risk reduction claims, unless the claim speaks to what we call a Schedule A disease, which is the diseases that are more serious, I guess, if lack of a better term. So things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, any claims that touches on those kind of diseases would need to be pre-market authorized. So you cannot make a claim like that without coming to Health Canada, providing the evidence, and the review, review will be done. Any other disease claim or such as um, risk factors such as cholesterol lowering 
All these claims do not trigger a mandatory review. A company can decide to put a claim to that effect on their product if they are confident that the data they have can stand up to the scientific scrutiny of Health Canada. Now, that being said, there is definitely strong post-market oversight on the use of these claims because they are really important for consumers to be able to trust that these claims are actually scientifically substantiated. So the enforcement arm of Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, will routinely go out there and look at these new claims and they will notify Health Canada if they see a claim that they have not seen before. And quite often we will contact the company and we'll ask for the data to take a look at to make sure that the health claim is substantiated. Because of that, a lot of companies actually choose to come to Health Canada even though it's not mandatory because they want to get that reassurance that before they put a claim on a product that they're not gonna get into trouble afterwards and may have to do make changes or in a worst case scenario, have to do product recall. So even though it's not mandatory, we do spend quite a bit of resources looking at data that substantiate health claims. And it gets a little bit confusing when, when we tell people that Health Canada has no mandatory requirement, and yet once in a while, we will publish an opinion to say Health Canada just approved a health claim. And people say, well, wait, wait a minute, I thought you said you don't look at health claims. Well, it's, it's voluntary, but a lot of companies choose to come in and ask for our opinion, especially for disease risk reduction claims. Now we get to other claims such as function claims. These, again, do not trigger a mandatory requirement and we don't see as much of these coming in asking for an opinion because I think overall companies have a pretty good idea what they need to do to, to substantiate these claims and they, they are a lot more confident about these claims. Then finally, general health claims. These are even more um, relaxed, I guess, and we again, we can provide some advice, but we don't really look at these um, from a mandatory review-based perspective. <coughs> so basically, this is what I just spoke to on, on this slide. Now, the same applied to novel fibers. Novel fiber, you, you may want to think about it as an implied health claim. And a company, again, is more than capable of making a fiber claim as long as they are convinced that that novel fiber material carries or performs one of those four criteria that I mentioned earlier. As long as they have the data and they feel confident, they can go ahead and make a fiber claim. But again, if this is questioned either by CFIA inspectors, by consumers, and more likely from a, competing, a competing company, then the CFIA will ask the company to provide the data and Health Canada will look at this from a post-market perspective. So again, because of that, a lot of companies would prefer to come in and get an assessment of their product to make sure that they actually do fit one of those four requirements to be a novel fiber. And since about three years ago, we have started publishing a list of officially approved novel fiber by Health Canada. And we continue to update that list. And at the end of the presentation, there's a link that you can go to to look at. I think there are over 20 novel fiber now that's been listed and approved by, by Health Canada. We always like to remind ourselves, even Health Canada employees, that when we look at health claims, there are different levels of health claims and there are different levels of evidence that would be required. Again, the disease risk reduction claims are the ones that have the highest bar, and we expect high quality data coming in from petitioners. And that it's also a slightly different approach that we take in, in Health Canada when we look at health claim data. 
for these kind of disease reduction claims, the submission can be actually quite extensive. It's usually they're quite large submissions, and a lot of times they are very extensive systematic reviews and meta-analyses that are done. And so it takes our evaluators a long time to go through that data. But because of the timing, quite often by the time the analysis are done by the petitioner, by the time it gets into our hands, by the time we go through it, two or three years have probably passed from the time when the data has been generated. So you could argue then that it may not be the most up-to-date information that is being looked at for that health claim submission. So our approach to that is when the review is done, our evaluators actually do another literature search to look at the most recent publications to see if there's any other new data that may be relevant, and they will actually add that to the final analysis before they make the conclusion. So the good news is that the review is the very robust, is right up to date. The downside is that it does take a long time, and it actually uses quite a bit of our resources in order, in order to do this. And the challenge there is from a, a cost perspective, because, because health claims are not mandatory, we don't have a regularly assigned budget to review health claims. And we have no control over how many health claims come in on a year-to-year -year basis. So it's very hard for us to manage the resources to get these health claims done. If we get two or three health claims coming in at the same time, then we are actually quite strapped for resources. And it would take petitioner a long time to get an answer to whether the health claim has been approved. That's the downside of not making it a mandatory requirement. If it's mandatory, then we have more leverage to ask for resources because there is expectation for performance standard and how long it takes to, to respond to a petition. So that's kind of where we sit right now is a lot of our health claim work are done with only very limited resources. And because we do such a thorough job, it does take a long time for us to, to reach a decision. So turning back to what we look at for scientific evidence, when we're looking at health claim in general and also for fiber claims, if it is beyond just energy function, if it's any kind of physiological benefit that's being communicated, then we expect that at a minimum, there has to be at least one good quality human study with a relevant population group that will have to be pre clearly presented. And our scientists will look at that very, very carefully to make sure that the data does support what the claim is saying. Now, this can be supported by other either animal or in vitro studies as well, but it doesn't replace a human study. It has to be at least one high-quality human study for any kind of health claim associated with fibers. The only exception here is, again, it goes to that category of the fermentation um, function. Here, in some cases, a combination of, of high-quality in vivo, including animal studies, even in vitro studies, can be acceptable. Because, again, we're not really looking at this as a true health claim. It's more a definition of a novel fiber rather than an actual health claim per se. And again, that's the one area where we're different than the US FDA. What I forgot to mention earlier too is that our flexible approach of non-mandatory assessment of fiber, that is also different than the US. In the US, any fiber claim that, has be, that wants to be used, there's a mandatory requirement that the, that the FDA has been notified and they have to approve that fiber before it can be called a fiber. So these are some of the links I mentioned earlier. Um, our policy, the latest policy, is just been further revised in 2017. It lists all the, it lists all the definition, the criteria, and even a little bit of the data requirement that's needed to substantiate each of the claims. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a list of 
approved novel fibers that just regularly updated. And that can be seen on that website. And then finally, we don't have guidance on fiber claims specifically, but we use the more general claims guidance document that we use for all types of health claims, including fiber claims. And that can be found in this third link where we go through all the different criteria and different um, levels of scrutiny that we put onto the data that is submitted for us to look at health claim approvals. So the bottom line is, and we do communicate with our FDA colleagues regularly, either by phone or in person. So we do try to exchange information as much as possible and try to be as harmonized as possible. And when you look at our overall approach to fiber, you look at some of the key criteria and some of the key physio physiological effects, we are actually very, very consistent across the two agencies. I think the only key difference, as I mentioned, is that fourth criteria around fermentation, where right now we still don't have um, consensus on whether that alone could be sufficient to qualify something as a novel fiber. In Canada, the answer is yes. In the US, the answer is no currently. So that's just a very, very quick run through of what is happening in Canada, some of the similarities and differences between us and the US, how we look at fiber. Um, I guess at this point, I don't know if you want to open it to questions or just have a general discussion around some of these things I mentioned, or things maybe I haven't mentioned can also be open for discussion as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a re really good question. Um, without getting into a lot of the specifics and all the red tape that different government agencies face, in our work that we do in our branch, which is the health products and food branch, we regulate all foods and drugs. On the drug side, almost every review is cost recovered, and for good reason, because the data packages are humongous. There's no other way to do it. In the food area, it seems like almost every time there's new management, there is that question, well, how come food is not recovered? And we will do an analysis. And the bottom line is the volume of pre-market work that we do in food is tiny compared to the drug side. And the amount of work that it will take to come up with a cost recovery scheme for food review simply isn't worth, that work is not worth the benefit that we're going to get by cost recovering. So, because in Canada, to have a cost recovery regulation, it has to go through Parliament. Because it has to be so carefully designed because of the whole potential, you know, conflict of interest and, and the data and all that, so it has to be really carefully structured. So that's cost recovery. Now, there is another mechanism called fee for service, where it's not a actual official cost recovery. You're actually just charging a fee to get something evaluated. So the best example people use is when you go get your driver license. You pay to get tested for a driver license. It's not guaranteed you're going to get it, right? But it costs that money to be able to write the test. So that also has been looked at as a potential mechanism. But there's only one downside we found out when we looked into it. It sounds really good, except unlike cost recovery, the fee that is generated by fee for service does not go to the organization that actually is doing the work. 
it goes to the general budget of the government. So that took away a lot of the incentive to uh, further explore that possibility. So unfortunately, at the current, the way the current things are, is we just have to manage with the resources we have. And, and if we do get a lot of health claim submissions, then we will try to bring in more resources to the best we can. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious about the point that you brought up, um, the difference in the fiber definition of the per of fiber being adequate uh, in Canada versus the addition of the health benefit in the U.S. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you see as the pros and cons of each of those approaches? And when you've seen them both applied, um, which one, you know, is there, have there been any case studies that give you a little bit of heartburn because of the, the less stringent Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. I, I guess I, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable standing here talking because my FDA counterpart is not here to defend or to explain the rationale behind the FDA decision. So it's kind of like an unfair one-sided contest. But I, I, know that from, I know that when we came up with that definition, we, we really thought long and hard about it. And we engaged our internal scientists when we also consulted with it external expertise as well. I think the strongest rationale that my team give me is, again, it goes back to looking at that whole fermentation and the, the short chain fatty acid and how it could provide potential a source of energy for either the, the microbial population in the gut or other tissues in, in the body. It's that whole idea of looking at it as a nutrient from energy metabolism perspective. And we looked at how we look at fiber traditionally. I mean, fiber is actually required in our nutrition facts table as one of the core elements. So we do look at fiber already historically as a nutrient. So this expansion of the novel fiber, fiber definition really is just another extension of looking at it purely from a energy perspective and a nutrient perspective rather than actually a health claim and providing other physiological benefit beyond just a nutrient. So I think that was the stronger, strongest argument, argument that we came up with to go the way we did. Now I can't really speak to why the FDA decided that that alone is not enough and you need to have further evidence to show a benefit before you can call it a fiber. But I know in Canada that was really the, the strongest rationale is because it is being looked at as simply just a nutrient. And again, that's where it goes to the, the idea that you know, the definition is the starting point, and then if you want to raise the bar to come at it from an angle of further health claims, then it gets into the health claim side of things. Okay, Harvey? Absolutely. Um, Health Canada, just like the USFDA, we participate heavily in Codex, and we believe in the value of work done by Codex. So to the extent possible, we always take Codex standard and Codex definitions into account when we do our own policy work. <coughs> that being said, our current fiber definition is actually very consistent with the Codex definition. The challenge is that with Codex, 
quite often it stops at a certain point. And it doesn't go deep into always clearly spelling out what a benefit is or isn't. Because to get consensus with you know, 100 member states around the table, they have to stop at a certain level. Otherwise, they will never get the work done. So overall, our fiber definition is definitely consistent. In fact, I mentioned earlier about looking at the fermentation aspect from a nutrient angle. We also look at the definition that Codex has for a nutrient. And the way we're looking at novel fiber, again, is 100% aligned with the Codex, Codex definition of a nutrient. So we took all that into account when we developed our policy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, obviously, there's a lot of overlap between some of these novel fibers and prebiotic. And it's not a coincidence that since we updated our policy and we introduced this whole new definition, including novel fiber, Inquiries and requests for prebiotic request approval has gone down significantly because the two are almost interchangeable in some ways. So, and that's another benefit for us. That's actually, the benefit is we now have a way to manage these substances as novel fiber and not have to get into the whole prebiotic. Now, we still get submissions and we still struggle with them especially, again, when it comes to defining some of the benefits. Are they actually measurable? Looking at some of the studies, are they actually relevant clinically or scientifically? It's not that simple. Um, but without getting into the details of prebiotics, I think a side benefit of this new definition is we're not hearing as much about prebiotics. Thank you for a great talk. Um, Maria is great friend right now. I'm curious if you could go back and talk to your you know, past self or past a group that was writing up the definition of fiber uh, when you first went towards this endeavor. What advice would you give the Health Canada team knowing what you now know about the review process and the physiological effects of fiber? Do you mean when we were revising it or the very first time when we came up with the first definition in 1985? Oh my goodness. And give some guidance to that group. That's a really interesting question. I, don't, I think I should have had a beer before I gave my talk. <laughs> I, think, I think it's really hard, actually, because not even back to the 80s, even if we go back about 10 years ago in Canada, the way we look at nutrients overall, and especially around health claims and how we manage health claims on foods and what is even allowed to be said about a food compared to a health product, there has been a huge shift in the thinking. So, I mean, 1985, I think I was still in kindergarten, well, maybe not quite. That world was very, very different in how we looked at food, look at claims in general. So it was a whole different environment that those scientists and those regulators were working at under. So hindsight's always twenty twenty. I think, and also I think back then 
it wasn't as much focused on this whole idea of, you know, product innovation and enabling, you know, choices. And, you know, back in those days, colleagues that used to work back then tell us those were actually simpler times. Health Canada says something, people will just listen and do it. Nobody challenges it. Nobody questions whether that's really the, the best policy or the best regulation because Health Canada knows best. Well, fast forward to today, that's not always the case. We're being challenged all the time. We have to make sure everything we do is science-based with the best evidence available. And while keeping health and safety of Canadians to be our priority, we also charge with giving industry the ability to innovate and to advance and give consumer benefits for products that are novel and beneficial to them. So I think the environment is totally different. So I think back then, the definition probably much more rigid because that's just the way things were done back then, whereas now we're working under a totally different paradigm. What I, based on my understanding is we, that was singled out because this is the one where if there is a large body of evidence that's really solid in vivo or in vitro, that that could be considered sufficient in the absence of either a RCT or a human study. Now, Again, I don't look at all these data every day, so I need to confirm that. But I think for this one, it's, it's, it's really a standalone, again, because of the whole different perspective on what this one criteria is speaking to. It's not really a, a true physiological benefit. It's, it's more from a nutrient standpoint. No, that, that's an excellent question. In fact, it's not so much the future. It's what we're facing already. That is actually another reason why I have more and more gray hair every time I come to these meetings. I think in my intro, it was mentioned that we also are developing a regulatory framework right now for what we call supplemented foods. So these are foods that at one time were regulated as natural health products. They are food vehicles, so they are beverages, they are bars, they are powders that have bioactive substances added to, them, added to them to give a benefit beyond just regular nutritional benefit. And we're struggling to try to find a way to manage these kind of products because they really don't fit our normal view of a food, but they're not a drug either because they're using a food as a vehicle. So we created this new category that is still not officially in the regulations yet. We're just calling them supplemented foods, and we're struggling with that right now, is once you, once you get through the safety part, when you get to the efficacy part, how do you determine whether the claim or the advertising is actually truthful or not misleading? 
And what population are you looking at? Is it the general population? Is it, or is it the population that the product is designed for? Which again, is not how you tra traditionally feel food. Food is meant to be for the whole population. But these supplemental foods are very targeted. So it, it brings a whole different perspective into the thinking. And we are currently working on this and we get a lot of, we're getting a lot of pressure to have this all figured out by 2021. Thank you.